Mother Dearest by Patrick Scattergood Read by Tony Carpenter Chapter 1 As I travel through the chilly night with the rain drizzling on my windscreen, a bladder full of piss and a belly full of hunger, there is one thought that plays around in my head with no signs of stopping. My mother is dead. The woman who carried me in her womb for nine months is gone forever. She's dead, buried, and now little more than food for the worms, maggots and flies that will slowly but surely devour her, and yet one thing comes back to me. My mother is dead, and I couldn't be happier. In fact, you could sum up my life priorities in one easy way. This car is running out of gas. I have no idea where I'm going, and I need to find somewhere to lay my head before I fall asleep at the wheel. Oh, and my mother is dead. This is as interesting as my life has ever gotten, except for the weird genetic mistake that gave me one green eye and one blue. Other than that, I'm a forgettable person living a forgettable life. A life of sin and sodomy, as my mother once said. I should be feeling the sadness and the overwhelming sense of grief that comes with losing a parent, but instead I feel relief, solitude, and most of all, a sense of happiness that feels like a warm, comfy blanket being draped over me. Part of me can't help but wonder if I can finally be myself, without the resentment for never fitting her narrow view of the world. I catch myself in the mirror, the dial on my dash edging ever closer to 80 miles per hour, and I laugh. A leaning my head back, mouth wide open kind of laugh that echoes in the silence. A laugh that brings tears to my eyes for the first time that day. Weird, isn't it? No sorrow at the funeral, or at the wake but tears of laughter in a cheaply rented hunk of junk. There are so many emotions behind the laughter, but the one that resonates is relief. She really is dead. She really is gone. I'm actually free of her and I'm glad. I'm happy. For some reason, that makes me laugh even more. But are you ever truly free? The voice takes me by surprise, and I jerk my hands on the wheel as my foot slams on the brake. The skid feels like it lasts a lifetime until I come to an awkward, violent stop in the middle of the road. Please, not now. Please, I'm begging you, not now. Slowly, I allow myself to look into my mirror, the sound of my breath feeling more like the roar of a restless sea. Frozen to my seat, I stare into the darkness. There is nobody behind me in the car. Nobody on the rain-slicked road. I'm alone. Maybe it's the lack of sleep playing tricks on my already fragile mind. When was the last time I slept? That must be it. I'm just tired. My mind is imagining things that simply aren't there. That's the only explanation for it. Surely it has to be that. What else could it be? Maybe you're insane. Maybe you've been off your medication for too long. No. This is not going to happen. Not tonight. Not any night. It is simply not going to happen. I'll drive my ass back to the hotel, throw myself onto the bed and sleep until room service knocks on my door to tell me to get the hell out of there. That's what I'll do. That's exactly what I'll do. No, you won't. Great. I'm even arguing with the voices in my head. Isn't there an old saying about the first sign of madness being talking to yourself? Yes, there is. The second is you answering yourself. No matter what it says, it's always my mother's voice. That slow, soaked-in gin and bitterness. The sort that never really goes away, not even after the bitch is dead in the ground. They say madness runs in the family, you know. My shaking hand turns the volume up on the radio, and a cheesy rock song from the 1980s blares out. I don't truly hear the song or the raid outside. I just want it to drown out the voice inside my head. I just want it to make it stop. All of it. Now you're just being downright rude. It takes me a few seconds to realise that my foot has pressed down on the accelerator and the car is moving through the night again, headlights shining in front of me as the only guide to where I'm going. If truth be known, I don't even have a destination. I'm just driving as far away from that house as I can get, as far away from the rapacious vultures that raised me and the gossip-filled mess of a small town that I used to call home. 
No doubt my quick and easy escape from the wake will give them yet more reason to talk about me, but I'll never have to step foot in that godforsaken place ever again. I had been stuck in that house for nearly six goddamn hours. Six whole hours of being surrounded by people I didn't know and who didn't know me either. Their hollow words of sympathy feeling like crooked nails being hammered slowly into my brain again and again. I honestly had no idea why I was there for so long, or why I put myself through that. Yet I stayed, did my part, nodding and smiling at the appropriate moments of the mind-numbing conversations around me. Not exactly a people-pleaser, are you? Standing there, in amongst those people, I couldn't help but feel the urge to escape, the compulsion just to get away from everything and everyone. Has anyone ever felt like that before? Of course they have. Everybody has. It's not a new sensation. In fact, it's a feeling as old as the world itself. There was one thing, however, that the people here hadn't realised. I was only there because I had to be, not because I wanted to be. I had to be there to try to go along with the societal norm of having to grieve for a lost parent. Nothing more, nothing less. So take that however you will. You utter asshole. The more these words incinerated their way through my brain, the more they felt like a confession. I hadn't been a mourner or a heartbroken son. I was a spectator. One that was glad that she was dead and never coming back. I guess part of me wanted to make sure of it, to prove that, ding dong, the witch was truly dead. I was her only son in the plethora of near-identical stepford wife daughters. I was surprised they didn't have to wear name badges so people could tell them apart. I was even more surprised that people noticed that I was even worthy of existing in their presence. You always were ungrateful, even as a child. A normal person would have shed a hundred tears at the thought of having lost a family member. A normal person would have spent hours looking at old photographs and remembering fond moments of their lives that they spent together. Me? I spent it stood by the window on my own, with a scotch in my hand, wondering just how early I could leave. It wasn't my first scotch of the day, and it most definitely would not be the last. You alcoholic piece of shit. The glass felt so comforting in my hand, a sign of a true alcoholic, I suppose. It sent me back to a time when, as a small child, I would stand by and watch the world go while clutching my comforter close to my chest. The funny thing about funerals and wakes is how many people come out of the woodwork and shadows before a body is even cold in the ground. The worms hadn't even started their feast and they were already milling around. Hell, for a woman that prided herself on having a near-perfect image, she did know some unsavoury people. Uncles that we had long lost contact with over various scandal-filled rumours of wrongdoing. One thought to have been the head of a pyramid scheme, losing people thousands in life savings. One thought to rather like partaking in the company of barely legal-aged rent boys. Somehow, each passing relative that I met seemed to morally degrade before my very eyes. I felt sullied by each interaction with these people that I apparently shared a seemingly shallow gene pool. Is it any wonder that I am such a failure when I share their DNA? Always ready to blame everyone except yourself, aren't you? For someone that was so imperfect, she sure as hell made it clear that you couldn't take one step out of line. Heaven forbid you should ever make any kind of mistake or be remotely different. If you didn't fit her view of perfection, then you were ostracised. And that's where I had spent the last five years. There was no family of my own to speak of, and that clearly added to my growing list of failures, and a job that merely enabled me to exist but not to live. The worst thing of it all was the simple fact that I wasn't even doing that very well. I would call you an idiot, but even that is too successful a term for you. The music intermittently phased in and out, filling the car with a sound of static. Switching it off, I drove momentarily in silence. The radio crackled and the car filled once again with that incessant noise. I flicked the switch again. I'd only taken my eyes off the road for a split second, but that's all it took. The car drifted into the other lane and the loud, angry honk of a car horn caught me off guard. I skidded back into my lane, managing to keep the car on the road. 
Cursing the radio under my breath, it flicked across to a different channel where a DJ laughed hysterically before switching back to the static that had acted as the soundtrack to my second close call of the evening. I suppose that's just my reward for skimping and renting the cheapest car possible. You get what you paid for, you cheap bastard. And here it comes, that voice ripping me to shreds, pointing out every single mistake I've made from the day I was born. Even with her dead and buried, the voice still haunts me. The rain is making it hard to see through the streaky dirty windscreen, but I know there must be somewhere I can stop and rent a room. These tiny arse end of the country towns always have somewhere, and they're nearly always ran by a useless husband constantly ordered about by his fat, loud wife. It never ceases to amaze me just how many stereotypes really are true. I shouldn't be surprised, though. This is the sort of town where marrying your cousin is seen as moving up in the world. I hope you've got your listening ears on, boy. There's a message coming for you. The radio jumped back into life, startling me a little, but bringing yet another throaty laugh from deep inside me as the radio started playing some twee song about buying a pair of roller skates. My laughter and the sickly sweet song made for strange bedfellows, but it kind of summed up the entire day thus far. Happiness in place of sadness, an escape in place of support. In that moment, I felt a strange compulsion to turn the car around and drive back to the house I'd not long come from. The house that had seen every moment of my upbringing and sure as hell had some stories to tell. But I continued to head into the darkness searching for a cheap room for the night. Cheap. The perfect word for you. Part of me was glad I had as it didn't take me long to see a grotesquely lit neon sign with half the letters smashed to pieces. It didn't exactly fill me with hope for a restful night but I suppose it would be a damn sight better than sleeping in this shit heap so I pulled into the empty car park with an exhausted sigh. I started to wonder if the place was open at all, as the rest of the lights seemed to have been turned off, when a hunched-over man exited one of the doors, holding a mop and rusty old bucket. Getting out of the car as quickly as possible, I rushed over to him. He seemed to be startled by my sudden appearance in front of him. Excuse me, are you open? Yes, sir, we are open. Not that you would know it thanks to that sign, he said with a wry smile, which seemed at odds with his tired and sad eyes. They were the sort of eyes that you know had seen so many things, things that would haunt a man to his very bones. Come with me and we'll get you out of the rain and checked in. I was intrigued by how his voice seemed to be both welcoming but weary too. A broken shell of a person at odds with the glare of the neon lights, a shadow crossing the world while waiting for its body to turn to dust and be blown away to never be seen again. The old man sped up and walked over to the only lit up room and threw open the door, making a bell clang to announce our arrival. It's just me up here tonight, so you'll have to bear with me one moment while I put old Shirley and Percy away, he said as he gestured at the mop and bucket he had in his hands and walked behind the counter. I wasn't sure if it was the fact that I had been driving for hours, my imagination, or something else, but the old man seemed to have come to life since we came inside. My eyes darted around the room while I waited for him to come back, leaving the tick of the clock to feel the silence. Faded artwork bought from a yard sale adorning the walls in dusty frames? Check. A snack machine with out-of-date snacks inside? Check. An ice machine with a never-ending buzz and an out-of-order sign hanging on it? Check. A grimy looking bell on the countertop. Check. Peeling stickers hanging from dirty windows. Check. An armchair in the waiting area that looks like it's held together by patches. Check. This place was literally a living stereotype. It was as if the owners had searched Motels 101 on the internet and copied every single overused thing. The whole place seemed to give off a bit of a Norman Bates vibe, but it was the only place in town that I had found. Everything ate. My body felt weary, as if I'd aged thirty years in one car journey. I stretched out my arms, legs and back as much as I possibly could. Everything throbbed and the dull ache in my head that had been there since I left the house continued. Who in the blue hell names their mop and bucket? I clamped my hands over my ears and started to hum to myself, hoping that the voice would shut up before the tired but kindly old man returned. I hadn't even realised that I was rocking back and forth on my heels until I nearly fell backwards. 
Cursing to myself quietly, I rested my hands on the countertop and tried to concentrate on the bell in front of me. I couldn't resist a sly smile at the peeling sticker next to it. With some of the letters missing, you could now ring bell for a tent. These sorts of places always made me wonder if the people that owned them cared about how the places looked, or merely went there to die in silence, away from the prying eyes of the world around them. The sound of a throat clearing brought me back to reality, so I looked up. The old man smiled at me, but I was struggling to focus on his face and missed half of what he said before realising that he was asking if I was feeling okay. I nodded and gave some rubbish excuse about being tired and having had a long drive, which seemed to satisfy his curiosity. I signed my name in the visitor log, which hadn't seen any entries for the last six months and was given an old-looking key. The kindly old man walked slowly with me to the door of my room before leaving me there with a cheery wave goodbye. For some reason I hesitated before going in. I just couldn't shake the feeling that I wasn't alone, despite clearly being the only tenant in this place. Looking around at the night sky, it felt like a hundred pairs of eyes were watching my every move. Scared of a motel room, are you? That's a new one even for you. My hand slammed heavily in frustration on the door, and I felt it shudder with the impact. Just shut up and let me get into this place so I can sleep. One full night's sleep, that's all. Is that too much to ask? It had been so long since I had managed to have a full night just to myself. No nightmares, no waking up screaming until my lungs were raw. I just wanted peace, quiet and sleep. That's all. Oh, my dear Naz... Do you want Mummy to hold your hand? Is that it? I rested my weary head against the cold wood of the door. I felt it give slightly under the pressure. Everything about this motel seemed cheap and nasty, but at least it was somewhere to put my head down for the evening, preferably without catching anything, but I think that in itself was a 50-50 chance. The key slid into the lock and the door clicked as I turned the handle slowly. As the door opened, my body lurched forward. I felt the darkness around me envelop everything in sight, and my world disappeared, leaving me spiralling into the shadows. The sky was a dark gunmetal grey, only brightening with each lightning strike. It felt strangely calming despite the foreboding that followed every crack of thunder, jabbing at my brain like a champion boxer. The sky itself felt charged with an energy that was both exciting yet dangerous. I knew I shouldn't be here, I knew I shouldn't stay, yet I couldn't take my eyes off my surroundings. There I was, stood in the middle of the forest with the trees giving me minimal protection from the storm. The rain lashed around me, leaving me feeling like it was soaking through not only my clothes, but my entire body too. I felt as rooted to the spot as the oak trees around me. It's not that I couldn't move, it's just that I didn't want to. Strangely, I felt at home here. It felt like maybe I was supposed to be here, but that I was here at the wrong time. The rain gave everything a strange, almost otherworldly glimmer. All I could think of was just how beautiful and serene the forest was in front of me. I could have happily stayed here for the rest of my life with no regrets. But even with the calmness prevailing through my mind... There was a tiny spark of anxiety that just wouldn't go out no matter how hard the storm winds blew. That spark felt like a protected candle that could withstand anything the world threw at it, but still burned brightly at the back of my mind. It may as well have been a neon sign that declared that it was here and was not going to go away any time soon. A deer stood in the distance. The creature was at least thirty paces ahead of me, but I couldn't shake the strange sensation that it was nearer that it was right in front of me. My mind always liked to play tricks on nights like this, but tonight felt different. This felt wrong. Slowly, almost deliberately, the deer raised its head, letting its ears prick forward, sensing danger nearby. The creature's eyes stared straight through me, making me feel invisible. I tilt my head to help my eyes adjust to the dark and realise that now the deer is staring straight at me. That's when I noticed... Its eyes were full of life, yet its belly had been split open and its insides were trailing through the mud. I took a step backwards in shock, but I couldn't take my eyes off its guts hanging from its stomach. Yet the deer seemed completely oblivious. 
A crack of thunder startled me and I lost sight of the strange creature. I tried in vain to rub the rain from my eyes as it ran down my face. The deer had gone without a sign that it existed at all. There were no tracks in the mud, no sound, nothing. Had it really been there, or had I imagined it? Was my mind playing tricks on me yet again? I walked forward slowly as the sense of anxiety in my gut gradually started to take hold. I crouched down and placed my hand against the dirt and felt it flow between my fingers as I tried to find something that felt real. My eyes closed as I tried to calm my rapidly panicking breathing. The sense of dread and anxiety grew deep inside me. I could feel it almost like fingers trying to take hold of my heart and squeezing tightly. If I couldn't calm it down, then I knew that those very fingers would be tearing me apart from the inside out. Lightning carved a bright slice across the sky that then froze in mid-flash. I sat down and let the mud envelop my legs and my hands as I stared at the lightning. Why was it not moving? The trees around me were still, the wind had stopped, and the jagged bolt of lightning just hung there in the sky. I tried to get to my feet, yet the mud around me held my body down. My legs felt like a large weight had been dropped on them, yet there was no pain, only the panic. Suddenly the deer appeared silently in front of my eyes, with its unblinking eyes once again staring deeply into mine. My body froze as if I were a toy that had run out of battery as the deer sniffed at me. A shiver tried to escape my body, but it dissipated into little more than a tingle. There was no reason to be so scared of this creature sniffing at me, yet I could feel myself wanting to run and not look back. But try as I might, my feet stayed exactly where they were. The feeling that I would be here forever started to creep into my head, and my breathing sped up even more. I wanted to scream out as loud as I could, but the only sound that escaped was a deep, raspy gasp of air. A tickling sensation started to touch the back of my throat, and I gagged violently as if I wanted to vomit, yet no bile rose. Still the sensation continued, and my breathing became more frantic. My body started to feel like I was falling, despite being completely prone in front of the creature with its exposed guts that hung, limp and useless, in the middle of its four legs. Finally, I managed to pull my hand free from the mud and slid my fingers into my mouth. I felt my tongue and my teeth with my mud-covered fingers. The feeling made the bile rise as they made their way further into my mouth before I felt something at the back of my throat. A sharp edge touched the tips of my fingers, and I grabbed it as tight as I could and pulled. With a hard tug, I pulled it out and dropped it onto the floor in front of me. Before I could look, the tingling sensation turned to a burning pain before the nausea took over and I retched violently. A scream slowly escaped as hundreds of bees burst from my throat in an orgy of bile, pain and noise. The buzzing of the bees felt like a drill boring through my brain as I curled into a fetal position in the dirt, with the deer staying to watch me. Tears mixed with the dirt and the rain on my face as I looked at the creature looming over me in desperation. I reached out my mud-covered hand to try to touch it, to try to hold it as if it would help me from the agony that I was feeling. Help me, I mouthed with each word like a dagger stabbing at the back of my throat. Still the deer stared at me without a flicker of emotion ever crossing its face, despite the hundreds of bees surrounding it, some of which landing on its trailing muddy guts that were hanging from its sliced open belly, making them sway slightly like an out-of-time pendulum. Please! The deer snorted and its lips parted, revealing jagged pointed fangs as it smiled down at me. Bees continued circling around us both. The sounds of the thunder, the buzzing and the snorting all mixed into a cacophony of anxiety and panic, masking the haggard screams and pleas for mercy coming from my own lips. The last thing I remembered seeing was a hoof above my face as the sound of laughter exploded from the open mouth of the deer. The damned creature was laughing at me while I was left like a discarded pile of trash. I managed to make out three words that floated through the storm before my world once again turned into little more than a silent blackness. Three scratchy words that flowed from the mouth of the deer as it laughed and slammed its hoof into my head in a shower of mud, bone and blood as my head collapsed under it. No. Not. Yet. Yet.